Good evening, everyone. Thanks to those of you who are joining us. Uh, Dr. Mark Burnley has really kindly volunteered his services tonight to talk about physiology. It's way out of my area of expertise, a comfort zone. We've actually got a second special guest tonight. So those of you who've watched some webinars before or just generally work in the sports science world will know uh, Dr. Jamie Pringle. So he's very kindly actually um, wanted to um, sort of get involved tonight because he'll tell you a little bit more about why. But um, without much ado, I'm going to really pass you over to those two and I hope you will enjoy the evening. If you've got some questions, just pop them in the comments box because I'll be modulating in the background and I can pop them on the screen at the end and we can discuss them. So as we go through, if anything pops up, just kind of think, put it in there and then we can deal with it later. So thanks. Over to you guys. Thanks, Bianca. Uh, thanks for inviting me back. Thanks for having me back. And I'll, I'll hand over to Mark in a second. I just wanted to um, introduce him with a slide that really represents a, a bit of a shared history. 24 years ago, I first met Mark walking into this lab at the University of Brighton. And this is the Bishop Carey lab uh, down there. And you can see on this picture a number of individuals that have significantly influenced my career and Mark's career. And that's the common thread between us, um, including the guy on the bike, Chris Baldwin, the cyclist who as you know, Bianca and I both worked with Chris and for Chris with the Bourbon Performance Centre in recent years. A number of other individuals on here have really shaped the landscape of British sport science and British sport as a whole. Um, the guy in the white coat is Andy Jones, Professor Andy Jones, a physiologist. And Mark and I shared a uh, shared his PhD supervisor uh, to the to us both. And the guy on the bottom right is Peter Keane, who some of you will know is a bit of a legend in the, in the cycling world at the time he was coach of Chris, but he also was the architect of the British high performance world class system as we know it today. A real brain behind how um, British sport has really taken the, the, the leaps forward in the last 20 years, certainly in the Olympic and the Paralympic realm. So why did I put this point up? Well, I walked into this lab and I first met Mark uh, on the basis that we were about to start on our own PhDs together, PhDs in exercise physiology all those years ago. And we've followed a similar path ever since. I moved off in, I moved from academia into practice. Mark has stayed around in practice, but always had a hand on the, on the uh, stayed around in, in academia, but always had a hand on the practice rudder as well. Uh, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome him back to have a chat 24 years later, um, because this is the kind of guy that when you work in practice, you need reference points in academia who you can trust, who are credible and can provide information in a way that's accessible. And one of the things that's really defined Mark's career and his work in those in that last couple of decades is that ability to make sense of noise, to make sense of a bigger picture, to prioritize it and to simplify it and to give the practitioner the things that are important and to bring attention to them, which is what I'm hoping he'll do tonight. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Mark. Cheers, Jamie. So yeah, that's this is the lab I, I did my PhD in uh, alongside Jamie. I seem to recall him wearing, a, I, I don't know why I've got this in my head, but he was wearing a grey polo uh, polo top at the time. So uh, anyway, that's, that's all, my only memory of it, uh, alongside meeting him, of course. So what I want to talk about today is exercise intensity domains, the physiology that underpins them, uh, and how they may map onto performance and training zones as well. And what we've got here, of course, is Anna Kiesenhofer in the late stages of the uh, Tokyo Olympic road race, which she won. And you might be wondering where she's going. Now she's obviously going towards Olympic glory, but at that particular moment, she's uh she's on effort street and the reason i put effort street up here is this is a place in southwest london as it shows on the sign but this is just outside st george's hospital medical school and this is where professor brian whip who spent the uh, last part of his career here who was one of the major drivers of the concept of exercise intensity domains of course exercise intensity domains are a mix of performance physiology and perception. I don't know any athlete who doesn't use a combination of these three things when they're training, when they're racing, uh, and when they're trying to structure both of those things. But what we want to try and tease out is 
how you would go about doing that and what the physiology underpinning it actually is. So we need to think about exercise intensity domains. And I simply put up the uh, a line from one of Virgil's poems, hoc opus hic labor esque, because there's always got to be some Latin in here. And what that essentially means is there is the task and then there is the labor or the toil. Now, Virgil was talking about going through the gates of hell, uh, which is not dissimilar to some of the exercise tests I've designed in the past. But what we're talking about here is the task is the performance. In the case of cycling, of course, that's power output. And then the toil, the effort, is something that can be measured in terms of perception from rating of perceived exertion that you see on the right hand side there or from physiological responses. And the latter, the physiological response, is the basis of exercise intensity domains. And what I'd like to try and convince you is that there are four, of which I'm going to speak in detail about three. And that is the moderate intensity domain, the heavy intensity domain, the severe intensity domain, and the extreme intensity domain. I'm not going to speak too much about the extreme domain, but the other three are going to get quite a lot of coverage because they map onto things that uh, in practice you may well understand. So, where do we start? Well, we start with the oxygen uptake response. And you can see here, this is the uh, VO2 response to moderate intensity exercise. Now, these are actually data from AV Hill. And what AV Hill did was perform running at 12 kilometers an hour on a grass track. And then he simply measured oxygen uptake. This would have taken him several days to do because you may take a Douglas bag measurement and you have to go away and analyze it because that you didn't have computers in the day to do all of it for you. But what he noticed and what he realized was if you start at rest, which is what he's got here, and then immediately start exercise at a constant speed or a constant power, then the demand of the task is set from the very beginning and stays constant. And then oxygen uptake rises to meet that demand. And it rises with an exponential decay, we call it, to reach a steady state. And in the steady state, the energy demand of the task is met entirely by aerobic energy supply. You also notice this oxygen deficit phase where energy must have been coming from somewhere else. And that somewhere else must have been anaerobic metabolism. We now understand most of that in moderate exercise to be the breakdown of phosphocreatine with a little bit of lactate generation as well. But this steady state is important because, of course, if you were to run faster, there'd be a higher demand. You'd reach a higher steady state. If you're running slower, there'd be a lower demand. You'd reach a lower steady state. And that's the fundamental basis of incremental exercise testing. So here we have an incremental exercise test. And this VO2 response you can see in a cyclist starting at zero watts. In reality, it's about 20 watts to turn the pedals over. And you gradually increase the work rate, the power output at about 30 watts per minute. Then you measure oxygen uptake. And this is oxygen uptake measured every 10 seconds. And you can see that rising as a function of time. And eventually you will reach VO2 max. And at that point, you reach a plateau. You can't you increase power output. You can't increase VO2 any further. But this linearity is useful because you could then set work rates based on the percentage of VO2 max. And that's done very frequently in the literature. The problem with that is that the VO2 response is not necessarily always linear. And so if you were to measure constant load exercise of increasing intensities, you can see this relatively clearly. And here we have some data from uh, Whip and Wasserman in the early 1970s, but this is presented in Whip and Mailer in 1980. And what you can see is for each bout of exercise, you've got 50 watts up to 400 watts. And the task is to maintain the exercise for 10 minutes. And then they measure oxygen uptake in response to those exercise bouts. And you can see that the oxygen uptake response reaches a steady state all the way up to 150 watts. And then at 200 watts, you start to get a drift upwards. 250 watts is very obvious, even more obvious at 300 watts. At 350 watts, the, the work rate is now, or the, the time, the exercise time is curtailed because the participant reaches task failure. And 400 watts, it's even more rapid. But in each of these latter cases, from 300 to 400 watts, the same endpoint VO2 is reached. We'll talk about that aspect in a moment. But this increase in VO2 means that you can't really talk about working at a percentage of VO2 max here because that percentage is changing all the time. And that's an interesting point. You can't really call this a fixed intensity 
because the intensity of the effort is changing. Your perception of effort will rise and you can see the physiological response changing as well. So how do we resolve this? Well, when does this actually start happening? Uh, the answer to that is at the lactate threshold. So if you exceed lactate threshold, and I'm going to say this is what you might call LT1 or the you might call it the aerobic threshold as well, but I'm just going to call it the lactate threshold, the point at which blood lactate starts to rise during an incremental test. You will see steady state VO2 behavior below the lactate threshold in the moderate domain. You will see slow component behavior above the lactate threshold in the heavy domain. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. So for some reason, I do apologize. For some reason, the uh, the figures are actually going over my titles here, but I'll talk you through it anyway. Um, so this is a VO2 response. You've now got breath by breath VO2 um, not, uh, interpolated to second by second values, which is why you get a bit more fidelity to the VO2 response. But we still see this exponential rise towards a steady state. But the key thing is during heavy exercise above the lactate threshold, we don't see a steady state. VO2 carries on rising and in the heavy domain, will reach a delayed but elevated steady state. So VO2 is rising above the anticipated energy requirement of the task. And that's that's important. But the question then becomes, well, where does that stop or where does that change and what, what, what signifies a change to that happening? And the answer to that is the heavy severe domain boundary. And this is where there's quite a lot of current controversy about which measure you might use. And there are several of which I'm gonna talk about too. So on the left-hand side, we have lactate responses to uh, several bouts of exercise lasting 30 minutes and lactate being measured every five minutes. This is for running from 16 up to 19 kilometers per hour. So in a reasonably well-trained runner. And on the other side, we have the ox, it's not the oxygen uptake response. We have the uh, power profile to various uh, intensities or various intensities in the severe domain. And there we're characterizing critical power. So if we stick with critical power for a moment, what you do is you set uh, work rates. So this is, uh, in this case, about 300 watts, uh, about 325, 340, and then about 370 watts. And essentially, you exercise the participant to exhaustion uh, on several occasions. And then you fit a line through that, usually a hyperbolic function. And the asymptote of that line is the critical power. That signifies the lowest intensity at which severe intensity responses are likely to be generated. Alternatively, you can use a physiological steady state measure, such as maximal lactate steady state. And what you do is you think you, if you think you know roughly where the maximal lactate steady state is, you essentially set uh, speeds or power outputs above it and below it. And then you try and measure steady state behavior. So you can see steady state behavior at 16 and at 17 just about at 18 kilometers per hour and then 19 kilometers per hour it's clearly non-steady state so 18 kilometers per hour in this case would be your maximal lactate steady state and the boundary between heavy and severe exercise so if you like the physiological side is a bottom-up approach so go until you don't see a steady state the critical power model is a top-down approach where you model behavior in the severe intensity domain until you can predict an asymptote and that's your domain boundary. But in terms of what happens above that domain boundary, you can see it here. So you have, again, the same data, essentially. But now we've actually superimposed or, or added the oxygen uptake response to this. And you can see that the VO2 response rises until VO2 max is attained in each case. So each of these bouts of exercise is a higher power output. Time to failure is shorter. And that time to failure uh, then defines the power duration relationship. So the key thing about severe intensity exercise is the slow component cannot be stabilized. And if you carry on, you will eventually attain VO2 max um, and task failure. That attainment of VO2 max is also associated, we know, with low levels of phosphocreatine, uh, low levels of uh, intracellular pH, and high inorganic phosphate concentrations. In other words, nothing else is steady state either during severe intensity exercise. And we can use those task failure points to then define the power duration relationship and therefore determine critical power and the curvature constant W prime, which is uh, defines the, the, the steepness of this curve. So that's severe intensity exercise. And if we take the whole thing in the round, what we've got now is each exercise intensity domain. So here we have the moderate intensity domain where you get steady state behavior. 
the heavy intensity domain where you get delayed steady state behavior. You can see that here. This bout of exercise, by the way, was performed 15 watts below the critical power, but the VO2 slow component drives the VO2 response above it. And that causes um, some significant issues. If you do prolonged exercise, of course, that's going to amplify the rate at which you draw down your glycogen reserves, for example. And then we have the severe intensity domain where you see no steady state whatsoever in both cases and you reach task failure when VO2 max is attained. So those are our major uh, in exercise intensity domains. If we look at it from a uh, an incremental test perspective, uh, these are what uh, Paul et al. presented in a recent review. And you can see the domain boundaries now. So we have the lactate threshold, or LT1, as we might call it, and then the critical power, or the maximal lactate steady state, which also has a number of other names, lactate turn point, individual anaerobic threshold. Um, LT2, for example, is often used. Um, and above that, we have the severe domain, sometimes also called the very heavy domain. Now, physiologists love to use loads of different terms for the same thing, and you can see them all here. I don't want to go into great detail about that, but I'm just going to call that lactate threshold and critical power as those two boundary points. And the interesting thing uh, about the physiology is that you can obviously carry on exercising until you fail. It's very rarely done for moderate and heavy exercise, but Black et al. did that not so long ago. So you can see here the blood lactate response and the VO2 response to severe, heavy, and moderate intensity exercise performed all the way to task failure. Now, in the case of moderate exercise in those participants, it took more than three hours. This was the top end of the heavy domain. So you see at task failure, a submaximal VO2, as you would expect, but after about 45 minutes. In the lower reaches of the heavy domain, you can probably go for up to three hours. And then the severe domain, uh, failure occurring in a few minutes. The interesting thing, you see the similarity in the lactate response is steady state, non-steady state, and obviously steady state in moderate exercise. But you also see the glycogen response. So this is at rest, after severe exercise, after heavy exercise, and after moderate exercise. Now you might say, well, heavy exercise isn't really associated with much glycogen depletion. That's the top end of the heavy domain. That simply means other factors might be involved, but there might also be glycogen depletion in specific fibers at that point, which might curtail exercise duration. And then, of course, there's obviously fat burning going on in the, the case of moderate exercise. But that does lead to the interesting question, what does cause uh, fatigue in these domains? And I'm pleased to say that this is something that Andy Jones and I wrote about, about in 2007. And I think this table still stands up reasonably well. So in the moderate domain, we're not so sure what causes task failure because it hasn't been often studied, but candidates include hypothermia in the heat, reduced central drive and motivation, so classical uh, central fatigue, uh, and muscle damage if you're running. In the heavy domain, we think muscle glycogen depletion and hypothermia if the environmental conditions allow are probably uh, operating there. We know for reasonably certain that high energy phosphate depletion and accumulation are players in the severe and extreme domains. And the distinction between the severe and extreme domain is simply that in the extreme domain, you cannot attain VO2 max before task failure occurs. And that rise in VO2 in what we call the primary phase, which usually takes two to three minutes to manifest itself, task failure occurs in less than two minutes in the, the extreme domain. But the, the, the mechanisms of uh, fatigue are pretty similar between extreme and severe. Now, we know also that the, uh, the way in which humans exercise, we don't simply exercise in one domain constantly. And a really good example of this is cycle stage racing. So these are data from 2007. This is an individual domestique riding in the 2005 Giro d'Italia. Uh, so this is a flat stage, stage 10. And you can see there's the uh, course profile. And this is the power. So the black line is the power. This line here represents the first lactate threshold. This line represents the second lactate threshold, as they call it, or critical power, as I'm calling it. Notice how long this participant stays in the moderate intensity domain, almost for the entirety of the stage, except for the last eight to 10 kilometers, when, of course, the race starts to go full gas. And you can see in this particular case, highest power reached within a couple of kilometers from the finish and then drops down still uh, around about 300 watts, but drops below the uh, 
critical power again. So this is probably somebody who's maybe led somebody out or, or taken a turn on the front and then dropped off the back and then finished the race pretty much freewheeling. So that's a, a flat stage. And this is quite typical. So Mark Cavendish, for example, um, people I know have worked with him have looked at his power profiles. He's really, really good at staying below his lactate threshold for all but the last few hundred metres of the race. And that's why he maintains that explosive potential, unless, of course, he's chasing points through the stage. The response to a mountain stage now, and you can see quite obviously you get more high intensity work. So here again is the lactate threshold and the critical power. And note that in the first climb, we have perhaps a full gas climb in this particular case, so an attack. And then moving on to the Stelvio pass. And you can see, again, they're exercising above the critical power, not much above the critical power, so clearly grinding uh, the early parts of the foothills. And then you can see power drop away. But interestingly, heart rate doesn't drop. And that would suggest to me that we know the Stelvio Pass is about 2,700 metres. And so this might be the effect of hypoxia on the power duration relationship. So this participant is still probably above critical power at this point. And then, of course, uh, the descent and then a, a subsequent climb later on. But note how little still of the stage is performed above critical power. And this is because you can't spend a long time above critical power because you will drain whatever represents W prime. And Phil Skiba's work has shown that pretty clearly. So here we have somebody performing uh, a cycle race and you can see at point one, they attack, exercise above critical power. This line here is the W prime or the W prime remaining and see drains away until the attack finishes, recharges, attacks again, but then gets shelled out the back and then gradually uh, makes his way to the finish line and W prime recharges. So you can clearly see the influence of these intensity domain boundaries and uh, essentially exceeding them on uh, performance potential and performance through a stage race. So that's performance. What about training? Well, exercise intensity domains, I'm going to argue, really map very well onto training zones that you know about. So um, the interesting thing, though, is the intensity domains model was not developed by people who were interested in training. They were developed at Harbor UCLA and by researchers in Kansas State out of uh, San, uh, University of California, San Diego as well. Uh, and essentially, they were clinical exercise physiologists who were interested in the, the mechanisms underpinning the exercise response uh, and CPETs and looking at uh, things of that nature. So Wasserman and the anaerobic threshold uh, and that kind of thing. So they were only really interested in establishing the gas exchange threshold or the first lactate threshold for patient applications. They weren't really that interested in the issues above that. At around the same time, the Cologne Group, Heck and uh, Maeder and other colleagues were working on OBLA, so the four millimolar lactate and subsequently the maximal lactate steady state. And they were using that to work out training zones. And that's roughly similar to the intensity domains, although it's, it doesn't quite map because they were all working around um, a slightly higher value. I think perhaps the first example where training zones really mapped well onto, or rather intensity domains mapped onto training zones was actually Peter Keane's BCF levels. So here is something I dug out, dug out of my garage the other day. Uh, it's, it's a BOA report from the uh, post-1992 Olympics looking at what we could do in terms of sports science support. And I say we, I wasn't involved in this, obviously I was too young. But this is a, a plot from uh, Peter Keane's presentation, which I've nicked. And essentially, if you look at it, level one is below lactate threshold. So that's uh, moderate intensity exercise. Level two, roughly heavy. Level three and level four, roughly severe and extreme. And latterly, polarized training, which has been popularized by Stephen Seiler and colleagues, They've used a three zone model that is broadly also broadly consistent with exercise intensity domains. So, again, what does that look like? Well, you can also find other examples. So this is currently on the British cycling website. And I'm not suggesting you only need to use three zones. And you can see there are various names for these. Um, I wouldn't necessarily be as mechanistically uh, sure footed about this, and particularly working on anaerobic capacity at such a, a relatively modest power. But um, there you go. It's something to hang your hat on. But I would want to look at things in a slightly more um, rigorous scientific 
uh, sense. So that's what I'm going to do. So uh, again, if you're looking at the uh, three zone model of um, Siler and colleagues for, for polarized training, uh, and then also how that maps onto the moderate, heavy, severe, and extreme domains. And so zones one, two, and three essentially map onto moderate, heavy, and severe. But that's not what this kind of thing really looks like in reality. This is what the human exercise response really looks like. So you can see moderate exercise, heavy exercise, and then severe and extreme exercise take on the vast majority of the exercise intensity spectrum. We normally only really consider the aerobic part of that spectrum up to about 400 watts in this case. But of course, a maximal sprint will take you over a kilowatt. And so an awful lot of your exercise intensity spectrum is non-steady state, unsustainable, and what we might call zone three. If we just focus in on the, the first 500 watts of that and represent that in a slightly different way, you can then see the exercise intensity spectrum. So the green is moderate, yellow is heavy, red, severe, and or extreme. So that's in a recreational athlete, and you'd map the training zones associated with that. It, there's a different story to be told for the elite athlete. This is what Chris Froome's uh, exercise intensity domains look like on the same scale from the test that he did at GlaxoSmithKline a few years ago. And you can see that what's happening here is the moderate intensity domain is enormous and it seems to encroach on the rest at the expense of the severe and extreme domain. The heavy domain is not that dissimilar to the recreational athlete in terms of its scope. It's around 70 to 100 watts in, uh, in size or about one liter per minute in terms of true aerobic scope. And that has a few interesting implications. And those implications are these. So if you've got a lactate threshold above 300 watts and above 70% VO2 max, the moderate intensity domain dominates the intensity spectrum. The absolute mechanical stress therein within the muscle itself around joints and within blood vessels is higher in athletes at any relative intensity compared to non-athletes. And that has implications for training adaptations, or at least some of them. So shear stress drives angiogenesis, which drives capillarization. And of course, a capillary doesn't really care whether it exists inside an elite athlete or not. If it's suffering or it's not suffering, but if it's experiencing a degree of shear stress, that will signal that uh, the, the capillaries need to grow. And so this may be why prolonged low intensity training is so efficacious in elite athletes because they're working at relatively high absolute powers and there's a lot of throughput in terms of uh, blood flow to the muscle and through the cardiovascular system. So zone one training, as we might call it, will automatically make up a greater fraction of the training intensity distribution in those athletes. But the similar scope for heavy domain in the elite athlete means that training is more likely to look polarized. In other words, if you were to randomly distribute training intensities for all of the, the training that you do, and, and you then look at the response to that, the response or the, the, the training intensity distribution will probably be polarized. But if we take a time in zone approach, what we see quite frequently is pyramidal training intensity distributions in elite athletes. And that may suggest that because of the relative paucity of the heavy domain, the athletes are targeting the heavy domain in terms of doing sweet spot work or more sweet spot work than you would get from randomly distributing uh, your training intensities across the range. So it may be an interesting point for discussion. The other question that I haven't got an answer to, but I just like to throw out there is, if you're trying to build mitochondria, do you work on exercise intensity or do you work on duration or a combination of the two? Uh, and the reason I ask the question is because we know, or at least we think we know, that PGC1 alpha is the switch that determines mitochondrial biogenesis. And so calcium signaling, for example, is one thing that can happen there, but also um, energy stores signaling or energy stores detection. So if you put the muscle under energetic stress through AMPK, you will then switch PGC1 alpha on again and then uh, develop and lay down new mitochondrial proteins. And Egan et al. in uh, 2010 uh, showed this quite nicely that for high intensity exercise of 80% of VO2 max intervals, you could get a very large signal uh, in terms of an increase in 
uh, PGC1 alpha mRNA, uh, whereas with the same volume of low intensity exercise, so about 70 minutes of exercise at 40% VO2 max, the signal wasn't quite as large. Now, that might tell you that high intensity exercise is better, but then Bishop would argue that there's a pretty strong correlation, or at least a, a pretty uh, reasonable correlation between the volume of training that you do and mitochondrial adaptation in terms of citrate synthase activity, for example, is correlated, positively correlated with training volume. Now, the only issue with that is that the training intensity within those studies is not necessarily all zone one. There's a mixture of zones one, two, and three, so moderate, heavy, and severe intensity exercise. And that's because most training studies have not used the exercise intensity domains model. And I think that's perhaps ripe for future work is to actually try and stratify that a bit more uh, accurately rather than doing 70% VO2 max all the time. This leads me to um, just finish off with a couple of thoughts from Anna Kiesenhofer about training. And this is something that she, she uh, put on Twitter a few days ago. Um, she was sort of shouting into the void about what training intensity should I do? Because I can't really find any evidence in the literature as to why I would want to do one kind of training over another. And she said, within herself, I can't find a pattern. I've had months where I've had VO2 max intervals. I've done months where I haven't done any of them. I've done low volume, high volume, polarized threshold and anything in between. And she said, I've had uh, great performances for my standards and her standards are clearly Olympic champion with all of these approaches. And the only pattern she can see is that she performs well when she has an overall balance of load and the right recovery and when she's happy and motivated. And I don't think she doesn't know how to use Twitter. But there's a key thing here, and it's something that uh, I've heard Jamie say many times. I've also heard Phil Skiba say it. And, and that is that the secret here is that there are no secrets. You need to stress the system. Yes, there are various ways of doing that. There's perhaps no right or wrong answer to that. But then you need to recover. And the adaptations will occur in recovery. And of course, you need to think about feeding and keeping yourself well as well. So, Hopefully, my take home messages here are that, first of all, exercise intensity domains are a thing. And I have to say that because there are, um, and I've heard from a number of scientists in the past who don't even think the lactate threshold exists as a thing. I think it does. And I think you can use it to stratify various exercise intensities. And I hope I convinced you that you can do that and that they can be used to understand the physiology, fatigue mechanisms, and performance during whole body exercise. They also, I would argue, underpin endurance training zones, or I'm not, although I'm not precious about what zones you use and how you break them up, I do think they should call back to exercise intensity domains to be really effective. But I also think we have quite a lot of work still to do to marry up the kind of specific adaptations that athletes are looking for and an evidence basis associated with exercise intensity domains within their training programs. And uh, with, without further ado, I will stop talking there. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, I don't know what happens at this point. Um, ah, yes, Bianca. Oh, appears no, well, I've appeared as uh, uh, Jamie had initially appeared to be able, but you're there. I thought you might have gone to the pub, Jamie, as threatened. So <laughs> I'd fill the void. <laughs> Great. Shall I take on a couple of questions? Um, what we'll do is, uh, if the guys who are listening in right now, uh, it's a good opportunity to to type a few questions onto the chat facility, and Bianca and I will try and field those. Um, but I will start off with a question of my own, if that's all right, please, Mark. Um, oh, yeah. You used some nice examples towards the end there about the realities of of training, including what I was quite interested in to see was some of the some of the actually the old school sort of language that was used and still is used in some cases. Um, I have always had a sense that we can get very bogged down in language uh, and terminology. And like you say, if scientists try and make something complicated, if they, if they can, they will. Uh, to the point that I did notice on that example you gave from British Cycling, it used the word threshold type training, but it was actually in the wrong location rather mm. than relevant to the various physiological landmarks that define what you've been talking about, lactate threshold and critical power. So um, just give us a little your, your perspective on that. Why do we why do people get that wrong? Uh, and how can we help not get it wrong? 
Yeah, I think it's it's a tricky one because I think what we need to do and is is essentially a, there's work to do in terms of gain a compendium of terms that mean the same thing so that we don't get tripped up on this. The, one of the problems is I think some terms mean different things. So um, I was talking to James Sprague a while ago and I talked about tempo running. Now, for me, tempo running is running pretty much on the rivet. Um, so, you know, 5K, 10K kind of pace, which is around and just above critical power or critical speed in that case. To James, tempo running in cycling is actually being in the heavy domain and doing sweet spot work. So that in itself, it just working in different uh, exercise modalities in different sports, the same thing means different things. And I, as scientists, and, and there, there is a slide, um, which I, I've still got. Um, yeah, so if, if I go long a bit and try and find it, I did cut some of this out. So I think there is a, I was, I was going to animate this as well. But this was from 1985. And this is uh, hex work. And this is the what they call the first threshold and the second one. So there are already eight terms for two thresholds in 1985. And as I said there, it's got a lot worse since. And there's the classic Jamnik presentation of this is what the lactate threshold is to scientists. And it's no wonder lay people get confused when there are three different, four different oblers on the same graph there. So as scientists, we don't necessarily help ourselves. And I think this is where exercise intensity domains as a concept can really help us because there are undoubtedly specific physiological response profiles in each domain. They are separated by threshold-like phenomena. And it doesn't really matter if you call it lactate threshold, ventilatory threshold, aerobic threshold, provided you know what it is that you're measuring. It doesn't really matter what you call it, provided it does an accurate job of differentiating those two domains. Very much the same with the heavy severe domain boundary. There's still a lot of debate about whether it's maximal metabolic state, maximal lactate steady state. There's now a maximal VO2 steady state or critical power. I think there's elements and, and arguments for all of those. I'm a critical power proponent because there's also other things you can do in terms of modeling the severe domain with it. Um, but nevertheless, you can use either one provided if you're statistically definitely below it or statistically definitely above it, you see the desired response. And, and in terms of training, of course. That's, it's the consequence of yeah. where you're exercising as an intensity. Yeah. Because sport is not done as incremental tests or even steady state no. tests. Uh, it's about what the consequences are of the intensity that you're yeah. pedaling at, you're running at, you're rowing at at that moment in time. Don't get me started about rowing, UT1, UT2, and everything else that sits within <laughs> 20 rows here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a minefield, and I think it's something we ought to tidy up now because it's, it's well past its time, I think. Very good. Uh, I've got another question for you there. Um, ah, let's take this one. Can you predict training according to body type, endomorph? Um, that's an interesting question. I guess we're, I'll, I'll just field that first, Mark, before we yeah. pass it over to you. Probably the bit I would take about that is almost the type of athlete you're working with, as in are they a games player? Are they a big, powerful, muscular individual versus the kind of the classical um you know maybe low low musculature of, of a of a you know an endurance athlete not necessarily so but from the different type of body type what implications would that have to something like the graph you're showing here and your yeah. expectation of maybe even where those thresholds might lie in relation to the maximum so like your chris Froome example related to a recreational exam uh, athlete if you didn't know anything else about the athlete but you could take that look at them and know what sport potentially they're coming from what would you expect to see in this in these thresholds and what the consequences would be for the training zones? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And um, if you just stick with cycling for a moment, um, there's there's quite a lot in that question, actually. You know, so can you predict training according to body type? Does that mean can you predict or prescribe training from body type? That's one question. Um, I don't have an answer to that. But if we stick with cycling for a moment, one of the things I've noticed is that you know, classic sprinters, you would expect to have a very large W prime, but perhaps a lower critical power. Um, so you, you could make a prediction of, of this guy is probably going to have a very large severe intensity domain, but also going to have the tools to deal with operating in that for substantially longer than uh, a, a, a GC rider, for example, or you know, somebody in the endurance uh, setup. So you, you can look at it that way. Um, 
But are the two, are the two mutually yeah. exclusive? Can you have somebody who's anaerobically powerful with that large anaerobic work capacity, W prime, as you refer it? Can you have that and have a high percentage of your maximum at your threshold? So you can have that endurance phenotype as well. Can you do? I it don't too? see why not. And um, you know, having you know talked to Len Parker Simpson about this and the way they dealt with the uh, the female pursuit team uh, and what they wanted to to do was try and enhance their W prime because they they thought well there are elements of the the team pursuit where you're going to need a lot of power and to burn stuff pretty quickly. Uh, so they they said, well, you're endurance riders. So what we'll do is we'll just strip everything away and put a strength training program in. And then we'll feed your endurance back into that because you've already got that base. So you yep. can definitely go in the other direction. Um, and if you can, then I don't see why you can't go the other way with somebody who's already got that strength base to then go for endurance. You might still see quite large lactate responses in that individual anyway. So that's, that's one thing to temper. I, di I did once test a recreational cyclist who used to be a power lifter and his lactate just went through the roof at a very, very low uh, power output, but he was smiling away quite happy, quite happy at nine millimolar. And he's just thinking this would, this would sting a bit, but no, he was fine. So yeah, you never know really on that one. And I think there were some good examples of cyclists who are currently in the, you know, the, 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 the domain that we, we watch and we're probably watching at the moment you know, a couple of Belgian and, and Dutch riders who come from the cyclocross background who are winning stuff where they can win sprints and they can win time trials and they can win up mountains as well. So they are showing all those things. And I think if you do have those things, you've got the makings of being a world-class athlete, no matter what you turn your hand to. Um, I have another question for you, Mark. Uh, I'm sure that I think there might be a couple more coming through on the Instagram in, in a second. But I've got another question for you about... Um, the consequences of exercise in the in the different domains are very clear that's what the, that's what you've been telling us they define yep. moderate heavy and severe they're defined by the consequence of exercising in this domain now that's a very steady state way of looking at it that's exercise in that domain in the yep. next one up, or the one above that to whatever level of exhaustion that might be or yep. depletion as you actually put in some of the data there yeah um Again, sport is not not usually delivered in a steady state manner. Um, but yeah. what are the consequences of exercising in a higher intensity domain to then have to drop it down to a lower intensity? And how does that change the physiological response to that? So if I go out and did 20 minutes of yeah. rivet tempo, and then yeah. I drop the, the pace down to a moderate lower intensity, what's going to be happening that's going to be different from if I just went out at that easy pace to start with? Yeah, so I mean, going back to uh, the, the W prime balance model, I guess is is a good one. And it's <laughs> that that essentially tells you how much of your um, curvature constant parameter, so you might call it anaerobic capacity, you have left. Um, what it doesn't tell you is what the physiological response to that is going to be, because of course um, you might, if you exercise in just above, like you say, and then you drop down, you're still going to have that ventilatory response you're probably going to have an amplified rating perceived exertion. So your, your perception of effort is going to be higher. And so perhaps your willingness to push again is going to be different. And that may play into the tactics of, of, of other individuals to notice that kind of thing. So I think you, you've got to be careful. It hasn't been often modeled. The, the closest we probably got to it is the intermittent work where broadly speaking, uh, if you do um, repeated, so, um, you know, 30 seconds on, 10 seconds off, and you, you just do it in each domain, you get essentially the same response you'd expect for constant load exercise in each domain, but it's not really flipping in that way. I suppose the other work that's been done is uh, Brian Whip's work where he, 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 or who was it? I think it was either James Day, I think it might have been James Day. I can't remember exactly who it was, but nevertheless, what they did was they did exercise to task failure in the severe domain and then either dropped it down to the heavier domain dropped it down to the moderate domain and if you do that then you can reconstitute um w prime if you drop down to the heavy domain it doesn't seem to reconstitute very fast at all and you don't last anything like as long as you do if you, you're exercising the moderate domain if you drop it down to a lower part of the severe intensity domain you can last for a few seconds more and nothing more than that so and that probably reflects the fact that you've you might still be overdriving some of the fibers that you that will share the work, but there's a lower workload. So, you know, they might actually start resynthesizing phosphocreatine. You get a bit more bang for your buck there, but not very much. 
So it hasn't often been looked at, but there are clearly consequences. And I think one of the things we often forget is that you're still going to have a high ventilatory demand. You're still going to feel it. It's still going to feel it in the legs. And that may influence how you behave in, in future efforts, for example, to your <laughs> advantage or someone else's difference advantage. Yeah, so and I'm also of when you were talking through that, and as you were presenting earlier, I'm also of the mind of Peter Leo's work and James uh, and Ego, and the the idea of the accumulation of work done yeah. up to a point in oh, there you go, that kind of stuff. Yeah. The, the accumulation of work done, either total work done or work done above a certain level of intensity that obviously has a higher cost, yeah. as you talked yeah. about, is almost now really quite well recognised, and I think deservedly. Mm that fourth yeah. component of endurance physiological yeah. uh, capacity yeah. um but it's quite a hard one to get a handle on not, not yeah. least because it's quite hard to actually do uh yeah. in real life because you need to put probably somebody through a you know a long cycling race yeah yeah um, and ida clark's work on that with with andy jones was also helpful yes in the sense they did two hour bouts of exercise and they very happily did a three minute all out test before and after it was able to try and estimate what the critical power was and found that critical power declines over a two hour ride. And so if you look at this slide, for example, perhaps we ought to have a down sloping uh, value for critical power there. And perhaps even towards the end, it might be following this trend. So it, it might be that catastrophic towards the end. We, we haven't really modeled it um, for, for exercise as prolonged as this. Um, but I also find it very interesting that uh, what they also showed was if you supplement carbohydrate, you can blunt that decline. Um, and now there's obviously yeah. quite a lot of evidence that, you know, what we thought was the, the maximal rate of carbohydrate ingestion or useful carbohydrate ingestion was perhaps underestimated. So again, you know, going for, if you, you can tolerate it from a gastrointestinal perspective, you know, upping your carbohydrate intake both throughout, but certainly later in the race might be pivotal in terms of being able to maintain what we call durability. And it's, it's important. I think, that it's you like to say it's the fourth endurance parameter i think you're right but it's also that has also now got two names fatigue resistance and durability so we can't help ourselves but invent these things i wrote down on my notes resilience as well so i'll give you yes. a third. <laughs> three three names yeah um we're making them up right as we go along we're all yeah. good and i think it's important what you said about there about uh feeding and fueling as a uh, as a really important not just as a, as a way to mitigate that but actually really is an important thing that, you know, fueling is, an, you've got to provide the energy to, to, for the muscle to work. And yeah. um, I do think, you know, world-class endurance performance and um, pushing the limits, breaking the two-hour marathon, breaking the seven-hour Ironman or the eight-hour Ironman for women is actually a battle of the stomachs, you know, rather yeah. than uh, of, of the, uh, what would, we would consider the cardiovascular and the metabolic fitness. It's the battle of yeah. fueling and what you can get in there. Yeah, um, yeah. It's really interesting, actually, because um, um, before we go to that question, um, the, the fact that cyclists now typically write their feeding strategy on their on their handlebars somewhere uh, so, or on their stem. And it's kind of like when when I used to do this long stuff, I just used to remember to drink stuff. And <laughs> I didn't really need much encouragement. I, and I'd say, right, every 15 minutes, I'm going to take something in. All you need is a watch. I don't know why you need to write. Anyway, that's maybe because they're just they're doing been, different things. Uh, quite a few years of people write, writing stuff down. I have seen, I've got somewhere a photo of somebody with their fueling strategy written on the back of an Orangina uh, drinks map. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another one. There's a good, there's a good question here in um, from the cycling physios from the, from the feed there, yeah. um, Facebook. Can you expand a little bit on when you mentioned that you, that you use the phrase W prime and yeah. what that actually is? Just define yeah. it for us and what that means in reality. You mentioned yep. you have mentioned it a few times already, yep. but give us a, sen a sense of why and how that's um, evidenced in different types of yep. riders. Yeah, I will try and get back to that slide. Um, it's it's not that one; it's the next one, I think. Yes, there we are. So, if you look at the um, power duration relationship here, you've got two parameters. Now, critical power is the asymptote of that relationship. W prime is essentially the amount of that's yeah, good. that's a good word. That yeah, good yeah asymptote basically is where this line approaches um, a flat line, and that's the asymptote. It's a theoretical thing. Um, so the W prime essentially is the amount of work that you can do above critical power before task failure. So let's say you stupidly set six hundred watts, you would reach failure when you met that line, 
And that would be after about, well, 60 seconds, let's say. If you exercise at 400 watts, then you're going to fail in about 100 seconds. If you exercise at 350 watts, then you're going to fail in about, uh, well, 180 seconds and so on and so forth. But the amount of work you would do in each case above critical power is the same. And that's why we call it the curvature constant parameter, because it's a fixed amount of work that you can do above critical power. Now, what is, what is it actually? Uh, I'll take the fifth on that one because, well, I won't. We think the majority of that energy store, if you like, comes from anaerobic sources. So substrate level phosphorylation, phosphor creatine and lactate accumulation. But there's very interesting work showing that if you impose hypoxia or hyperoxia, you can change the curvature constant. So there is an aerobic component to it, O2 stores and other things, which might also contribute to the W prime. And of course, if you uh, undergo hypoxia or hyperoxia, there are also changes in other physiological systems. So uh, ventilatory sensitivity, chemosensitivity, which might also feed into W prime in ways we don't fully understand. But what it means is it's the amount of work you can do above critical power. And there seems to be a correlation, although not a particularly strong one, but a correlation between the muscle mass you have and your W prime. So that's one of the reasons why doing strength training might be beneficial in increasing that curvature constant. Um, creatine supplementation as well might help, but fundamentally, it's the amount of work you can do above critical power. The muscular grunt, as I often explain yes. to people, and it's not just about the force you can produce; it's about it's about the, that grunt, the the density of that work, and a fixed yeah. amount of work you've got, presumably fixed, maybe not quite so, but a, you go into the red, you've got this certain amount of energy you can burn. You either burn it yeah. long and thin or hard and fast. Yeah. Um, good question from Jose here. Is there any objective evidence for age group or masters athletes that training at slightly above the lactate threshold is more beneficial for raising the threshold itself than training below? Nice question. Very nice question. The answer is I don't know off the top of my head, but it is pretty common in, in every athlete I've worked with to talk about pulling and pushing on the threshold, right? So, you know, doing a lot of um, zone one, low intensity, high volume work to try and push the threshold up and then be doing heavy intensity exercise or working heavy domain, what James Sprague would call tempo work, what I would call um, steady state work to increase and try and pull up the threshold. Um, there's also, of course, the same deal with the critical power. So typically, if you're going to try and raise critical power, you do it with um, what I would call tempo work, so exercising on that, you know, close to it, just above it, maybe doing redlining where you're exercising just above it and just below it. So, you know, um, track athletes do that a lot in terms of surging work, that kind of thing. But if you're exercising above it, you're going to be doing intervals. So to try and pull that up with interval training as well. So long intervals, if you're just below it, um, short intervals, if you're working significantly above it, that kind of thing. So 800 meter reps in um running is, is pretty common you know five minute reps in cycling you know 10 minute you know 10 or 20 minute reps sometimes you can you can do as well to try and push on that part of the threshold too whether it's um for age group or masters athletes uh, whether that differs from um, younger athletes um we don't think it does actually you are trainable whatever your age so i wouldn't necessarily say there's a difference between them um but what you have as a master's athlete is you probably have slightly better cycling efficiency just because of the, the accumulation of, of that training load over time if you've been training for a long time. Um, so you get that benefit as well. So your lactate threshold will probably occur at a higher power output because of that anyway. Yeah, and I think that's probably the more relevant point there that a well-trained endurance athlete who has a high threshold as a percentage of their maximum, and you mentioned it before, you know, you could be operating at 350 watts as an elite male cyclist below lactate threshold and the consequence of exercising there might be different from somebody who's less well trained in absolute terms but also has their threshold at a much lower percentage and so that that metabolic turnover the mechanical turnover all those stimuli for training adaptation are simply not going to be as big and the risk is that the lesser fit athlete tries to push up the intensity and goes at a higher intensity 
first threshold, maybe even creeping above critical power. Yet that comes with a lot more consequence around cost and fatigue. Um, yep. And potentially that in itself might be the limiting step to adaptation. It's just you can't do enough. Yep. You know, you, you get yep. tired. Whereas the yep. world class athlete can be riding at that um, or running at that higher relative, uh, higher absolute uh, turnover and still be getting, a, you know, as big a training effect. So I think the classic phrase there is it depends. Yep. Um, I would also throw into the mix there that I think that kind of concept around. Uh, training intensity distribution, which we you briefly touched about, and polarization, and so on and so forth, is probably a secondary question. Actually, is mm. to, the, to the fact that do as much as you can and don't do too much. Yeah, and recover. Yeah, and recover. Yeah. Um, another question here. This is a good one, and this is I've, I've noticed quite a lot of uh, noise on social media in in, in recent weeks um, about this particular one. It's from Instagram. What do you think to athletes testing their own lactate levels during training and using this to inform their efforts? I like the way the question is being phrased. There's, there's some some thinking behind here because a lot of people just test it to get the numbers. But that mm -hmm. important phrase in there is to inform their efforts. What do you think to that, Mark? Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one because if you have a power meter or a Garmin or, or whatever it might be, any other kind of um, you know, Fitbit, whatever, where you can get a measure of speed if you're or running, for example, um, and you have a lactate monitor, provided you control that and you control the effort and you know, take a sample before and after, you can use it in exactly the same way as you would in the lab. You just then do your own incremental test. So you want to be doing five minute stages, typically some, some argue for longer than that, um, at a constant speed, constant power, and then take a lactate sample at the end of it, then up it and go again. So you might want to do a, you know, an incremental test as part of your training every month. I don't see I don't see any problem with that, given that lactate monitors now are you know so the the, the handheld ones are pretty uh, cost effective, pretty, you know, pretty easy to get hold of relative to a bike, for example. So uh, I don't see a problem with that. the The only issue I have is if you um, do a, a free range training session and then measure lactate at the end of it. I'm not <laughs> sure what information that's going to give you. Um, especially if you kind of sprint at the end and you say, oh, my lactate's quite high. Well, of course it is, yes. So I wouldn't necessarily, you know, unless you control the power or the speed, lactate's not going to tell you a lot unless you know what you've what you've input into the system first rather than simply using it, you know, ad hoc, if you like. And I do think the the popularity, if you like, or the ease of measuring lactate is because it's one of the most accessible measures, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the one that we need to be paying the most yeah. attention to though yeah uh, there are other things that would be far more interesting if we could measure them and far yeah. more thing of how the body is not just responding to the, the intensity but how it's adapting to the actual stimulus that you're throwing at it which is yeah. obviously the physical part of training um you also mentioned mark in in there around uh <laughs> you use the phrase there are no secrets and thank you for ascribing me to that i think i would always say that that there are no secrets um there's just consistently you know, mm. consistently good work, um, athletes who understand what works for them and they rely on the things that they do work for them. And, they, and most importantly, they have the defining factor of they are self-aware and figured out their own their own body, but also how they respond to different training yeah. sessions. So the answer to that question about testing your own lactate levels, that's only as good as being able to contextualize those numbers to say, mm. what does this mean? What does it mean yeah. for what I'm doing, but also for who I am? And what does it mean compared to what I was doing last week, last month, or last year? And I think you're right there. I don't think there are any secrets there. I think it's about doing as much as you can without doing too much, recovering, and, and remembering the key fact that adaptation to training is the important bit, not the training itself. Mm, it's, what happens exactly. afterwards. it's what happens as a consequence to what you're doing is the bit that you're going to get fit. Yeah, and I think it's also worth pointing out that we kind of – we, we perhaps like to think ourselves as knights in, knights in shining armor with all of our scientific knowledge, but fundamentally, when you're working with an athlete, what you're doing at best is taking out some of the guesswork. That's, that's what you're there for. You're not there to kind of completely radically change everything. And whenever I've worked with an athlete, they've already got their training in place largely. You're tweaking stuff. You're not making wholesale changes, and you shouldn't expect to because they'll just tell you where to go yeah. because they know their bodies. And I think that's probably a good a good place to to finish and wrap up, though, Mark. And you you finished that very nicely. I introduce you 
Uh, we'll pick up that question in a second. I introduced you in a moment to say that uh, a few moments ago to say that you were one of my reference points in the academic realm and the science realm, or someone who can take complicated uh, topics and reduce that noise and make sense of them. But it's only by actually seeing what happens in the real world that you have that context by which yeah. you go, this is important and this is more important than that mm. and these bits. So I, I do uh, very much appreciate your um, your uh, your session tonight and the wisdom that you, you've thrown at us. Um, we've got the last question for you. Who's going to win the Giro d'Italia in a couple of weeks' time? Uh, well, interestingly, my son and I spent yesterday watching Back to the Future 2, so I'd need to get a sports almanac for that and uh, go back in time in my DeLorean. I can't do that, so uh, pff, don't know is the simple answer to that question. Um, Simon, Simon Yates, that was, that's my... Uh, yeah, I think, well, I mean, it's, it's all going to depend on, as it always does, what happens in the mountains. Just keep your fingers crossed. Yeah, keep... yeah. You're on Bianca. mute, Bianca. Bianca, you are on mute. It's been the story of the last two years. Great. Yeah, the story, <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> Great. We need like a little secret code. Yeah. Um, I was saying thanks for watching, everyone. Um, and thanks to you guys, both Jamie and Mark, for doing that. Uh, we've definitely learned a lot. Um, so I hope everyone else will. And that's as a non-physiologist speaking. Um, and we've actually got a link to Jamie's previous talk um, on our um, YouTube channel. Jamie, I actually can't remember what it was on. Can you Can you remember what it was on? Oh, thank you, Bianca. It must have been that. I know. Moment. I know. Is that terrible? It was right? very good. I can't remember a thing about <laughs> oh, it. I know. It I think... um, we picked up on some of the. It's pretty much what the slides on the screen right now. We picked up yeah. on some of the, the ideas of um, delivering, delivering an effort and the power of delivering an effort and how you might pace a race and how might optimize that as well. Yeah. Obviously, did watch it because I was there. So, <laughs> but anyway, thanks everyone for watching. And uh, I guess that's. And that's us done now. Um, Mark, just before we go, um, if people want to follow you on Twitter and stuff, how do they get in touch or like your YouTube yeah, channel? Uh, Dr. Mark Burnley is my Twitter handle, all one word. Um, and the uh, my my YouTube channel, which I do need to add some stuff to, <laughs> and I, I will do in in, year, in weeks to come, is All Out Physiology. So that's my YouTube channel. So there's plenty of stuff on there. You'll recognize some of the slides at least because as we all do, we kind of have our favorites and we recycle them. So um, there we go. But yes, there, there's lots of stuff on VO2 kinetics, power duration relationship, fatigue, and all sorts of other interesting things in there as well. Brilliant. Thanks guys. And see you all soon. Thanks. Thanks.